Hello, and welcome to the Argyle CIO Leadership Forum. My name is Nick with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. A couple of notes before I turn things over to our panel moderator. First, a quick reminder to stop by our sponsor's virtual booth at any time during today's event and for the following week. Our partner is committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience at any time during today's event. You can visit their virtual booth from the main agenda page, which include complimentary materials, information, and meet and greet opportunities. To ask questions throughout the session, simply type into the Q&A chat, and we will address your questions at the end of the session. Now, without further delay, I would like to introduce our moderator, Ankush Kona, former Chief Data Officer, City Block Health. We're excited to have Ankush, Yue, and Zach with us for a panel discussion titled Top Data and Analytics Trends for 2024. Welcome, Ankush. Over to you. Thank you, Nick. Um, it's an absolute privilege to be here and lead the presentation. Uh, with that, I'll just uh, you know quickly do an introduction of myself and then I'll hand it over to the panelists so that they could introduce themselves. Uh, with me, I'm a seasoned um, you know transformation leader spent almost uh, in my entire career in um, helping organizations uh, really propel towards becoming a data-enabled organization. Um, and you know, my recent focus has really been you know, taking the next step in the journey with these organizations to now helping them you know, um, address the, the, the AI technologies and how do you really become an AI-enabled organization. So with that, um, Uwe, why don't you just uh, introduce yourself? Hi. My name is Yue. I'm a physician by training. And then I started my career in using healthcare data for 20 years, leveraging data and digital innovation. I provide support for medical, commercial, regulatory services. Thank you. And I work currently work as a director at Praxa. Thank you, Wei. Zach? Hello, um, my name is Zach Photographs. Um, my background is in astrophysics. Was lucky enough to switch to data science at the very beginning, uh, working on human computer interfaces. Um, since then, I've worked to, um, both in Europe and in the United States in um, uh, both startups, small organizations, and big organizations. Um, I currently serve as the senior director for advanced analytics on the um, um, uh, forefront of what we do in machine learning and AI at First Tech. Um, and there is a uh, an interesting set of problems that we uh, we address uh, daily. We'll talk about those in a few. Thank you, Ankush. Again, thank you, everyone. Thank you to the panelists and the attendees for joining this conversation. Uh, let's let's deep dive into this conversation. So, you know, Zoe and Zach, I think one of the, we are nearing towards the end of 2023. It's been like an amazing year in terms of, you know, how the emerging technologies have evolved. At least in your experience, you know, looking ahead, you know, how we look in 2024, where do you see the emerging data and analytics trends to significantly start impacting the industry? Um, I'm sure you folks are, you know, uh, implementing a lot of these modern edge emerging capabilities. So with that way, why don't I hand it over to you and you can share some of your experiences and then Zach will come back to you. Yes. The first is AI driven analytics, artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques will continue to advance, enabling more sophisticated data analysis and prediction capabilities. AI-driven analytics will empower organizations to gain valuable insights from complex and large data sets, leading to enhanced, enhanced decision-making processes. Two is augmented analytics. Augmented analytics combines AI and machine learning with human expertise to automate data preparation, analysis, and report generation. This trend will enable data and analytics team to work more efficiently, providing actionable insights to decision makers in a timely manner. Three, data privacy and ethics. I think we will talk about that later about this. 
The fourth is stream, streamline, streaming analytics as real-time data processing becomes more critical. Streaming analytics will gain prominence. Organizations will leverage technologies to analyze data as it flows and derive insights in real time. Back to you. Yeah, no, thank you, Wei. Zach, anything from your experience as you are foreseeing, you know, the things that you are implementing, anything you see as emerging trends from your standpoint? Sure. Um, everybody talks nowadays about uh, large language models and how these are used, right, in, in several areas. Uh, it's the trend of the day. People talk about uh, general AI and, and all this kind of, you know, neat stuff. Uh, but I think, um, you know, beyond the areas of application of these new technologies, one needs to go back and look at uh, data and how data are governed, how data are shared, uh, what are the policies with regards to uh, people curating data and uh, sharing data, right? That's one aspect. The second aspect is that we use all these things, both data and advanced techniques, for um, either our clients or our members, right? Whatever the case might be, depending on the organization. So what are the steps that we mark towards personalization? How are these techniques being used effectively to personalize? How do we talk about member centricity or client-centric uh, interfaces or processes, if you wish? And how do these tools allow us to be better at that? How do we proceed with regards to change management? Uh, all these things when applied uh, change people's and employees' life, right? To a, to a certain extent. Uh, sometimes resistance is there in applying these techniques or um, adopting these techniques, right? So how do we go about effectively introducing all these new um, things, uh, tools, uh, processes, and um, <clears throat> um, present them in such a way so that they are adopted with least resistance and used for the betterment of our members or clients? So there is a lot of fronts opening up, right? Both on the front of um, technologies per se and tools, as well as in the modes of application of the same. Back to you. No, thank you, Zach. And I, yeah, I think it is, it is an year of AI. I think everybody is talking largely about AI stuff. I mean, I think few other things in my personal experience that I foresee in 2024 is really, I think the emergence of newer operating models, architecture and skills, I think organizations will have to start really looking and rethinking about, you know, what kind of skills they need to build. Uh, also, I think you know, value, in my opinion, will come from an intersection of, you know, emerging technologies coming together. Uh, so I think that's something that you know, organizations will have to start, uh, you know, really paying attention to quite a bit. And obviously, I feel like, you know, even in the matter of AI, I think uh, there will be a lot more verticalization of AI, uh, where it will become more industry specific as we, as we see in 2024. Uh, so, you know, these are like few other things that at least I have seen and I'm seeing in, in, through my discussions with a lot of leaders within the industry. With that, I think my, my second question, Zach, to you is, you know, what are some of the innovative ways, at least in your experience, uh, either within your current organization or within your industry, have you seen, you know, organizations or companies applying data and analytics uh, for very improved decision making. And if you have like an example or a few case studies, if you can just quickly share, I think with the participants, I think that would be very meaningful for them. Thank you, Ankush. Um, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> um, I will start and, and connect the dots between different uh, self-contained uh, ideas, which at the end of the day form uh, a whole, right? Give us a whole picture. So I will start talking about uh, client lifetime value or member lifetime value as being one of the um, leading uh, indices or KPIs one can look at to get an idea of what one's client basis or member basis looks like, right? What is the financial impact of the member basis on the organization? Uh, that's most of the times easier said than done, right? There's a lot of um, uh, tools, uh, statistics, mathematics that go into the evaluation of, of a forward-looking quantity, such as the member lifetime value or cl client lifetime value. Uh, as we said before, it gives us an idea of the financial impact of who our clients are and what, it, what are the expected, what is the present value of expected proceeds, let's say, from our client basis. 
Now, imagine that we have a way to connect, let's say, for example, comments that our client bases leaves on either, uh, you know, social media, our site, you know, um, uh, through modules that allow for such interaction. And we have the capacity of going in, um, utilizing transformers or large, large language models and analyze such unstructured data. And at the end of the day, make the connection between what forms negative experience out of these comments connected to the member lifetime value or the client value, and also connected with the persistence of these instances of these comments, right? You imagine if you do that, which is something that we currently do, as a matter of fact, within First Tech, you get the idea of what are the nagging problems that your client or your member population has, how long they've been into existence, and how they affect the member basis on the financial front. And I think that's very powerful, right? Because with this kind of analysis, you, you know what are the things and the issues that you need to prioritize, how to prioritize them in terms of impact, and then how to proceed to give in a seamless solution to your members, right? That's only one example of combining uh, ML on the lifetime value part of things with large language models on a more advanced AI front with results that affect the entire basis. So back amazing. to you, Ankush. Yeah, no, amazing, Zach. Wait, anything from your side on the Paraxel cl clinical side from your experience, anything you can share? Yes, I just copy and paste a link that about the recent study. And what we did actually, we used data tokenization, data linkage. And we actually were the first to combine patients survey data to claims data and by look at different data, data sources to provide a better view of patient journey to further understand the patient's need, the bottleneck to recruit diverse patients. In this way, we are able to recruit diverse patients, including senior patients, as we know that currently our society is an aging society. So we need to take care more about the aging population, the mental problems, the different problems and digital literacy as well. So our way of integrating different data sources by using tokenization, protecting patients' privacy, but to know better their needs to deliver patient-centered care. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. You know, I've been part of healthcare, so I can completely resonate with that. With that, what you just shared. Um, with that, I think uh, you know, let's let's go a little bit more deeper into some of these data and analytics. And then one of the areas that at least has has grown uh, and has recently captured quite a bit of improvements is you know natural language processing, right? I mean, it has been quite a bit of this year where a lot of advancements have been made. Uh, so again, way I would like to start with you in terms of from your experience and anything that your teams have been able to apply, where have you seen or what, what are some of the improvements from an NLP standpoint that your teams are leveraging? And if you could just give a few examples, I think that would be great. Yes, there's a lot of work. Recent advancements in natural language processing, including technologies such as transformer models, Multimodal NLP, Google's BERT, and Elon Musk's GROC have significantly transformed the language understanding. Open AI's introduction of ChatGPT4, coupled with the Enterprise API, further make that the evolving NLP landscape. So there are key improvements that I would address. The first is enhanced language understanding. Streamlined customer inter interactions lead to improved customer support and the communication efficiency. Comprehensive data understanding. The multi-modeled NLP allows analysis of diverse data types, not only limit to text, but more about the like, image data, for example. So if we want to look at patient journey to understand the patient's diseases, we not only look at claims data, the doctor's notes, but we also look at the x-ray, we look at slides, so we can have more 
understanding patients' disease status as well as their own concerns, providing the comprehensive understanding and also for marketing strategies and the data-driven decision makings. And Google's BERT, you might know that it helps us to use the Google search better and they can provide a more diverse, precise search insights for us as well. And you might also have heard about Elon Musk's blog. Grog introduces humor and engagement, potentially improving brand perception and customer interaction. And we all know that with ChatGPT's contributions, ChatGPT4 provides more accurate responses and more creative, collaborative, and save more time. So think about other thing about business decision making and hiring, right? So now it's more easy for employers to screen applications documents to understand what kind of talents they're looking for. Of course, you know, candidates also needed to be better prepared. I know that medical schools are providing some AI training for radiologists and pathologists. And those people who know how to use AI, how to use natural language processing, or how to communicate it with people with AI so can be better prepared for the natural language processing that is shaping the world <clears throat> and enhanced customer interaction, the ability to engage, more natural and engaged conversations, adaption to public sentiment. So we actually did called social listening. So by looking at social media data and we can understand public response towards specific product, whether they like or what their concern is, whether they think is the product is not safe or it's very efficient. So all those by monitoring public perception through sentiment analysis, businesses can adapt strategies and measures influencing decision-making in marketing and brand management. Safer work environment. As we know that during pandemic, the mental problems is very, very significant. But by using natural language processing and using the safety monitoring so people, employers can better understand whether there are potential problems among employees. I also want to mention soft intelligence in recent natural language processing strides. In addition to the mentioned improvements, soft intelligence is more important. For my work, one of my projects was to do regulatory intelligence and to develop platforms to look at regulatory documents. However, we also needed to read between the lines to really understand regulatory agencies' comments, whether their comments are positive or negative. So that requires natural language processing to be more advanced, to, to provide emotionally intelligent, relevant responses. The same technologies we used for to analyze healthcare providers, review their opinions regarding any medicines, which is really important for the soft intelligence to better understand. So in this way, industry can respond to emotional nuances in customer interaction, improving customer satisfaction and strengthening the emotional connection between business and the clients. In summary, the advancement in natural language processing, including ChatGPT4 and integration of ChatGPT Enterprise API play a pivotal role in shaping business operation. Back to you. No, thank you, Wei. Um, 
Yeah, I think it is an amazing emerging field. I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, work going on. Zach, anything from your side uh, that you folks have used NLP or any emerging things from an NLP standpoint that you are excited about uh, that you would like to implement in the coming year? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I would like to make a connection with question one that I saw, uh, the trend most likely to be surprising. Uh, I think large language models will hold surprises, but not in the sense that one might expect. Um, I will use a phrase by uh, Michio Kaku, one of the uh, best known cosmologists, physicists out there, who um, uh, characterized large language models as glorified tape recorders, right? <laughs> Believe it or not. Uh, why? Usually uh, people, um, you know, in, in science, people in... Um, uh, the um, uh, analytics field, we, we usually get excited by new tools that will allow us to uh, explore further and move further the analysis we do in new, um, in new terrain, right? But at the same time, we need to be aware of shortcomings that may not be apparent yet, right? Uh, one such thing, I think uh, Yahweh already touched on when she talked about uh, a regulatory aspect, right? Finance happens to be one, one of the heavily uh, regulated industries and use of large language models there is something that one needs to take with a grain of salt, maybe a couple of grains of salt, as a matter of fact, right? In figuring out whether um, um, large language, language models can be effectively used and whether we can trust them. Having said that, uh, I think an interesting trend that we will see will be the, um, the standing out of uh, specific uh, large language techniques um, as, you know, uh, overpowering, let's say, uh, the mode or uh, doing a better job than others um, and uh, proliferating to many uh, different fields, ranging all the way from, uh, you know, medicine to biochemistry to uh, uh, modeling in uh, more mundane aspects of our lives. Um, that said, um, it's, it's expected uh, as the next thing that a lot of people work on and uh, look after uh, is is generalized AI, right? Um, how can we get to a stage of uh, providing uh, through AI uh, a much better understanding and um, a, uh, a a kind of behavior, quoting quote unquote, uh, more uh, to to um, um, the human standards, right? So. Before we expand more into this, let's. I, I would invite us to uh, to go back into um, you know more applied use cases uh, and how we used or how we use AI currently within First Tech. So, a simple example of natural language processing uh, could be the uh, transact an automated transaction descriptor, right? So, as you know, there is a heavy uh, amount of data um, of the order of uh, billions of transactions that we have to uh, process on a daily basis, right? And um, it would be nice to decrypt the kind of transaction strings that we receive from the various stakeholders and have a meaningful understanding of what these transactions stand for. Well, this is exactly what we do within First Tech, right? And, and we're not the only ones doing it, as a matter of fact. There is, you know, um, agencies like uh, Experian out there or Axiom who do, you know, approximately the same thing, right? Uh, the point is you need to pay for them or you need to pay them. In our case, we decided to do it in-house and we currently have, for example, a module that allows us to uh, have a continuous uh, monitoring of transactions and a full description of that of that the, these transactions stand for. Um, and the, and the uh, descriptions go to, to a great detail, as a matter of fact, that allow us to get a better understanding of how our members move, what they're interested in, what their needs are at the end of the day, and how we go about addressing them. Um, I think that um, uh, a, a, another aspect that is very promising, and again, um, it touches on natural language processing, is utilizing the results of such analysis of unstructured data into recommendations. Uh, as you know, the, um, the financial uh, industry is not an Amazon, right? We don't have thousands of products, um, uh, you know, uh, pushed out uh, on a daily basis or different providers of such products. Instead, we have um, a very well-defined line of uh, a small number of products that we need to make our bases aware of. 
so the, the game of uh, recommendations in our case is a little bit different, right? Uh, in, in exactly this regard. So the support that we get from analyzing through natural language processing techniques um, unstructured data we have, whether they pertain to notes that somebody got in one of our experience centers or notes that somebody left on our website or social media that I mentioned before, all these provide support as features within the recommendations engines that we use, right? So this is um, um, a tangential, I would say, um, uh, added value that comes from using NLP in the context of recommendations. And there's more, but um, I, I will cut it at this point. I will cut it short and turn back to you, Ankush. Yeah, no, thank you, Zach. I think those are those are very meaningful examples. I think for me, the one thing that I bl was blown away, and I'm sure everybody, you know, quite a bit of people have seen this, was the, the Tesla customer service chatbot assistant talking to a customer uh, when the person started to just browse the Tesla website and the very natural conversation that individual was having, and it was predominantly driven by a chatbot. So I think that multimodal NLP, in my opinion, will take a lot more precedence in 2024 and that I think would tie back to the question number one, which was, you know, the trend, which I like to be surprising. I feel, I think the evolution of LLMs is going to happen at a much faster pace. I think the question really that would surprise me is how much of these enterprises would be able to adapt and how much would become, uh, you know, a stone age thing in matter of months and days when the next thing gets out. So I think that's the, big thing that at least I am tracking in my perspective is like how much of that would be truly implemented by the enterprises. Um, so, so I think that's, that's, that's something that at least in my opinion, uh, I see that's where the trend is moving. Uh, you know, the other question, I think um, most of us have had, you know, being in this, in this role is, you know, some of the trends for, the the data and the IT organization, you know, predominantly, you know, continue to face the challenges, right? And there are a lot of challenges, obviously, in my opinion, that, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, the organization faces. I think the the discussion we can we can trend towards is like, you know, what what are some of the big challenges that at least in our experiences, you know, we have seen. Uh, that are faced by the data and IT leaders and what can they really do uh, in terms of, you know, trying to look and go after these challenges. So with that, Zach, why don't you get started first? Uh, you know, any, any thoughts on some of the biggest challenges for the data and IT leaders from your standpoint, right? I mean, you're one of the leaders within the organization. What are some of the challenges you are facing? And then how are you going about solving those? Uh, you know, if you can touch upon a few examples, I think that would be great. Sure, thank you. Um, I, I will try to make the connection with uh, what I see as Q3 here, uh, which was a struggle for us too, right? That was one of the greatest challenges, getting the buy-in from stakeholders and uh, getting a budget to actually be able to pursue all these things, right? Um, so what we did in this case was, first of all, we made use of uh, independent bodies, uh, consultory bodies like uh, Forrester, for example, or Gartner, right? Because independent of what one says within the organization, as a member of the organization, he or she is being viewed as uh, biased in the sense that they already belong to the system they observe. So we pursued to getting independent uh, views from, as I said, Gartner, uh, Forrester in this case, um, and uh, try to establish, for example, the fact that uh, member lifetime value, lifetime value is a, pro is, a um, uh, is, is a focal point that organizations need to be aware of, right? And um, the reason we did that was that we knew that if we embarked on uh, lifetime value calculations or evaluations, that would be a long uh, journey. Given the kind of the number of products we have, uh, and given that each one of those needed to be treated with regards to the lifetime value that members in it um, carried, we knew that this was going to be a long effort. And therefore, we got, um, you know, we, we established, first of all, the case. We tried to give a an approximate ROI expected out of this effort before we started. We engaged with outside independent um, 
uh, consultants like the ones that I mentioned to strengthen our points. And then we made sure that we approached the executive team uh, with you know, quite an arsenal of arguments that we could use to gain their buy-in. In our case, we were successful. Um, it took time, it took effort, uh, and it took synergies between different stakeholders, uh, the advanced analytics team, and the executive team. So that, that's one of the challenges, right? Getting the buy-in. Uh, a second one has to do with change management. When uh, one introduces um, new models or new ways of addressing um, you know, propensities of whatever sort, uh, one usually gets uh, in front of uh, pre-established notions or understandings of uh, business stakeholders that it's difficult sometimes to move from, to move away from, right? So one needs to be aware that introducing um, new aspects, a probabilistic view of what is going to happen is, is a point that is usually, um, you, you know, difficult to accept face value. And there is a lot of work that needs to be done education wise and communication wise with stakeholders to get them along this journey, right? At the end of the day, if, um, if, you, if the analytics team is the only team talking about analytics, the game is lost. The point is to have this adoption of analytics throughout an organization. So that's a second challenge. The third one has to do with data. We all talk about data, but most of the cases, in most of the cases, data is not clean. Uh, it's not perfect. Um, you know, there's missing information. Uh, and the governance on data is an aspect that in many organizations has not been, you know, seriously or well uh, taken into account and addressed. So establishing a data governance body within or next to uh, analytics is uh, something that needs to be done, right? Um, when it comes to third-party data, enrichment of data, accessing data, uh, all these things need to be described in policies, established and respected. Otherwise, you know, you have the tools, but you don't have data you can trust on. So I will stop here because I can go on for you know for a long time talking about challenges, and I will give the opportunity um, to uh, UA and Ankush to expand more. Yeah, yeah you want to just quickly expand on something that Zach did not cover? Yes, I want to mention about data privacy and uh, security because I also see a question too is about data is king. Yes, I like that. Data, but no data is perfect. And the, the question to also mention about the serious risk point about concerns, best privacy practices, yes. When I worked for CMS, so they use different tokens and we use AWS to store data, but still, you know, there's always the trends and the data cannot be protected. So data privacy and security is very important with increasing volume and sensitivity of data being collected, organizations must be prioritize data privacy and security, staying up to date with evolving regulations, ensure secure data storage and transmission, and implementing robust data governance practices will be essential to maintain customer trust. To me, I just mentioned about our innovative method method using tokenization and data linkage. While tokenization is like not the only solution, it can enhance privacy and security by replacing sensitive data with meaningless tokens. It is just one part of a comprehensive privacy protection strategy. Organizations should consider a combination of techniques such as other strategies and access control, delete data when it's not needed, right? Store data only it's needed. Additionally, staying informed about the regulations and industry best practices, provide a training, refresh training to any people using that. And that's what I'm thinking about and also about talent acquisition and retention. You see that there's demand for skilled professionals in IT. However, we also need to think about it because the changing landscape, the chat GPT, 
So the skills required are different every year. And about data quality, we know that garbage in and garbage out, we also need to be very clear, you know, data quality and have a whole picture of data, not limit to one certain aspect of data. And also AI should be ethical and responsible. In this way, we can create a more diverse AI and use that so the leaders, managers should navigate the issues related to bias, algorithm transparency, and ethical use of AI in the decision making. And that's all that I want to add. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Wei. I think for me, um, you know, the one challenge that I see in 2024 for most of the data and IT leaders is really, I mean, with the with the emergence of AI and how fast it's moving, I think for me, it's still the going back to the fundamental question of, you know, how much can the enterprise really adapt and scale with the amount of innovation that is happening? And so there will be a lot of strain and stress on the IT and data leaders to start enabling these capabilities uh, much faster than their current infrastructure or their current environments can truly support. And that's where I feel like they will be a lot of strained resources for them uh, in order because of the years of technical debt that has been acquired into these organizations. I just feel like it, it's something that they will continue to be challenged for. I know we are almost at the hour um, of the discussion, but what I want to do is take a few minutes and really see if we can get some questions answered. I know we did answer some of the questions through these discussions, but Zach, do you mind just taking this question of, in your experience, what trends are more impactful to the modern business? Do you do you mind just taking this question very quickly? Sure, sure. Um, and I would approach the question in a different manner, right? Uh, the, the success or not of a of a trend. Uh, is is tied to the return on investment on a specific effort, right? So I would turn this question to its head. Uh, have we done an analysis on ROI and have we determined that at least on this level of analysis, it makes sense to uh, approach a specific problem using a specific trend? We're all talking about uh, large language models and uh, and AI and NLP and so on and so forth, right? And it is it's easy to get up on the uh, you know excitement of the of the whole uh, progress moving forward. But at the end of the day, we're responsible of bringing results, right? And whether we want it or not, results are tied up to financial impact. And such a metric could be ROI that one utilizes to figure out what is the expected financial impact of adapting one, one such trend, right? What is the effort that's gonna go in? What are the resources that are gonna be utilized? What is the timeline and the horizon that one sees for adopting a specific trend? And then what is the expected um, profit to be made out of it, right? And then if that makes sense, then the trend is promising. Otherwise, you know, uh, you, you might not be one of the first to adopt a new trend, but rather what is, you know, already established. And again, going through the exercise, making sure that, you know, at the end of the day, you will be successful and you will have a positive financial impact for your organization. Back to you, Yeah, no, thank you, Zach. And I think there is also, I feel like the impact in my personal experience, I think to the modern business is really about, you know, where you are in the journey, right, of your maturity of an organization. So, if you are much ahead of the curve, then you know obviously some of these trends might be easily, you know, you could be easily able to adapt them. But if you're much earlier on in your journey of maturity, then it might take you a little bit more time to adopting some of the trends because you just can't, you know, wake one morning, one morning and say, "I want to implement AI." Right? It just doesn't work that way. You need a lot of other things to be put in place before you even start about implementing AI or even advanced analytics or, as a matter of fact, anything to do with even you know simple reporting and 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 dashboarding. Right? So so there are just uh, a little bit of upfront work that needs to be done. Obviously, as the things have gotten evolved, you know it's become a little bit more relatively easier 
to to building things out but at least uh, in my opinion i think that still holds the biggest challenge i think um, the other question at least um, that has come through the chat uh, channels is and we if you if you want to pick up this one you know where have you seen uh, at least in your experience um, you know where have you seen the greatest challenge in terms of maximizing the use of data and analytics like why do you think the organizations or at least in your experience you have been not able to maximize the value of data and analytics can you shed some light on this well yeah so for the challenges i think the communication is key uh, i'm thinking about digital and data literacy so different people from different cultural backgrounds they actually might have different, you know, digital literacy. So I did a research about how, like, all the population they might be resistant to use the new technologies. And interestingly, actually, I saw a survey that actually forty-five percent people, not limited to old population, they actually are resistant to the new technology development. So if the leadership actor team they are resistant to that technology, then there will be the big obstacles and how can we help to solve the problem? So communication, provide a training, provide a feedback to network, to talk to our leadership team, to have that the mindset to be more open to the digital change, to drive digital transformation. No, makes sense, makes sense. And I think, um, you know, just something for me, from my perspective, I think one of my personal experiences of why organizations really haven't been able to maximize the use of data and analytics is, um, I think it's just to change management and just the amount of redundant depth that has been created over a period of time. And not looking back and saying, you know, uh, have we used this? Uh, or have you built this before? So not just asking the right questions, I think, has led to, uh, you know, being the adoption issues. I think we are almost very close to the time. I would just take this one last question for today. Uh, what are the cost risks of being an early adopter of these trends? Zach, do you want to just quickly take this one? Sure. Um I, as as mentioned before, uh, the financial industry is by its very nature uh, more kind of uh, conservative with regards to being an early adopter, right? Do we know what's going on? Of course we do. Do we adopt it right on? Probably not. Uh, we're we're going to have to go through, you know, series of tests, series of use cases, uh, some of them going through re regulatory inspection and then adopt technologies that will move things you know uh, to to um, to new directions having said that um, it's always the case that you know uh, a greater risk signifies greater profit at the end of the day right so if we're talking about a new organization that wants to um, uh, to excel in a specific area and that area can be served by these new technologies might it be LLMs or what have you then uh, sure, uh, it's it's something to seriously be considered, right? As if successful, it will uh, it will make an impact for sure. Back to you, Ankosh. Perfect, perfect. I know. I think Nick, we are almost at the top of the hour. Uh, you know, I would like to just give it back to you. And again, thank you, Zach. Thank you, Wei, for this time. I really appreciate this. Uh, I think it was a great conversation. Uh, over to you, back, Nick. Great. Uh, thank you all for such a thoughtful and practical panel discussion. I also want to thank everyone else for joining us today. This session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. 